Howdy ho, friends and foes, and welcome to Dads on Life, your weekly episodic show about parenting from a male perspective. I'm your host, Jay Miles, and with me, as always, are my co-hosts, Keith Bogan. Sure. And Doug Hammadike. Howdy. Chad is currently, or will be shortly, uh, traveling back from Columbia. Uh, don't know whether he has his uh, family with him or not, but... Um, we will, you know, we, we will get in, into that next week, and get into his trip and all the, everything he would he noticed and things like that. Um, because we will be post a bunch of different things uh, and heading into, uh, <laughs> we'll get into Christmas and all that, because let's start with, uh, with yesterday, yesterday being Halloween. Um, from my experience, it was much busier than I thought it was going to be. Um, I have seen a bunch of people saying, you know, certain things, but saying that uh, some people had nobody. Uh, we were completely out of candy by about 4.30. So it, it was much better busier than I thought it was going to be. And there were much larger groups than I thought they were going to be. Um, I'm sure Keith just locked his door and went into his basement like he usually does. <laughs> um, so, well, sure, somewhat. <laughs> what, what did you guys experience? Uh, I will tell you that I didn't leave that. That's not true. I went out of the house for a couple of hours in the mid-afternoon time. So I can't speak to like 2 to 4 p.m. But in my neighborhood, uh, historically, we don't have trick-or-treaters until around dusk. Uh, and then it goes through about uh, 8, 30, 9 o'clock. And there was not, uh, from, from uh, dusk until, which is around 5, to about uh, 7, there was not a single knock at the door. And then really? I went on... And wow. you probably saw this on Facebook. Then I went on a uh, one-hour walk, which I, I normally do at 3 o'clock, but I did it last night at 7. So I walked the entire neighborhood, the perimeter of it, and there was not – I shouldn't say there wasn't a single. There was – I encountered one family of um, three adults and about five children under the age of seven that was so intent on trick-or-treating that they were crossing a major highway to do it. Oh, uh, boy. I basically oh. went, on yes on foot. So that being thirty three, right? Slap the hell out of them, but I didn't talk to them. I just walked past. Uh, and then just before I got back to my house at the end of the hour, I did see a couple of kids sitting in front of or walking right in front of their own house, but they weren't going anywhere. Um, but this is a neighborhood with multiple thousands of people, and essentially no one was out. But there were I could hear backyards, children playing. Um, little parties happening, uh, and I posted a picture of one uh, ha one house where they just threw a sheet on the side of the house and played a movie for a bunch of, and they really looked like they were three and four year old kids, you know, really small. Right. They're all in costume. Um, nobody went anywhere. There was hardly any physical movement in the neighborhood. Period. It was it was a, a, the, the spookiest Halloween I've ever seen because nobody was going anywhere. Now, to me, being not only the old fart of the group but also having no kids who are living locally anymore. Um, I thought that was great. I thought that everybody did what was a responsible thing, the most the thing to protect their kids the most. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I look, as I'm walking around, I'm seeing all, almost everybody's porch light is out. That's the, the universal signal, don't knock on my door if there's no porch light on. Um, you know, maybe 1% maybe of the houses had a light on literally maybe one percent um so as a neighborhood and nobody there was no movement here there was no uh, campaign it just they all came together and everybody did the exact same thing it was just remarkable to look at and i am hearing reports of other neighborhoods where a lot of candy was given out and a lot of trick-or-treating and whatever but my neighborhood didn't go that way not at all doug yeah i mean um i yeah, it's interesting. I mean, uh, for us, it was like, I think there was like more kids than uh, normal. And I don't know if they came over from other towns because we did have uh, 
three towns like within the let's say 15 miles from us that uh did decided not to uh allow trick-or-treating so i don't know if it came from there but uh it, there was lots of kids on the street and also uh on, I, I don't know exactly where keith lives or whatever uh but um i do live on main street so uh, obviously main street broad street you know it's going to be crowded and bustling with kids um, they were in small groups, mostly within their families. I didn't really see like lots of uh, groups of people who were all friendly, although we did go out in a group with our next door neighbors and another family from church. Uh, they came down. So we all went together, you know, in a pack. Um, but uh, like I said, uh, a couple of their families did do the chalking idea. And uh, I, it was really cool because uh, there was also at least uh, five uh, houses, I even took pictures, that, that they actually used a tube idea where the people were up in the house and they dropped it down like a big water tube, you know, the candy, you know, to the kids. So that was pretty cool. I, I mean, that, that was uh, really nice to see. You know, we whether had, yeah. if it was COVID, it was something cool, but <laughs> it, was, it was cool to check out, you know, that they were actually doing that, you know. And the whole chalking idea, like I said, keeping uh, people six feet apart, like the one florist by us, uh, she does, well, she's obviously a florist, so a lot of people stop by her business. So she had it all chalked out that, you know, so people would stay at least six feet apart, you know, coming up to her thing. And she had a one-way thing, entering and exiting. But um, yeah, uh, a lot of the houses, I would say, like... If I was going to say that uh, in a, versus last year, I would say 75% of those houses were still lit this year. But uh, some of the bigger ones and all, nothing. They, they actually, uh, no lights on this year. And uh, of course, traditionally, it, it's the thing to go see the mayor and uh, people who are, uh, are state electives. So they were at the um, Burrell Hall and uh, we got to see the mayor and uh, state of the police uh, chief was there and uh, local judges and stuff. You know, they always like hang out there to meet and greet the families as they come up. So at least you could put a face on some of your elected officials at that time. You know, it's always fun to see. Well, at least if you enjoy politics and stuff like that or know what's going on in your town, it's always nice to see their faces, you know, at least once a year but uh yeah so we had like a little thing here we had some pizza and stuff and uh there were kids here till probably like eleven o'clock at night but uh unlike uh, new jersey uh pennsylvania only allows trick-or-treating between well not pennsylvania uh but the majority of uh, towns only allow trick-or-treating at certain hours so, we were only allowed six to eight. So at eight o'clock, that's it, it's done, you know? So you know when to be out and expect kids if you are gonna do that. But um, like I probably already said uh, previously is that um, actually in our area, it's mostly younger kids. We don't really see many teenagers, not many kids more than, you know, 13 and under, I'd have to say make up 99% of the kids that are out there. You know, like to so, me, that's the way it should it be. A, Halloween's all about uh, little kids. You know, it's always really frustrated me to see teenagers going out there. Not only, uh, I don't mind them getting dressed up and having fun with it, but to go in and basically take the candy out of the kids with the little, little kids' mouths, you know, they shouldn't be trick-or-treating. They should just be having fun with the dress-up part of it. Uh, but in this neighborhood, we've, we've previously had a lot of teenagers, literally 15, 16, 18 year old kids come in the doors and asking for candy. That's, that's ridiculous. I'm sorry. That shouldn't happen. No, the, the, um, here it was, uh, pretty, uh, pretty, you know, went pretty well, pretty easy. Um, it, it, we, there were a lot of kids out, but, uh, one thing that I did notice that uh, that usually happens. I didn't notice a lot of this year. Um, you see a lot of New York cars um, in our area. I didn't see many at all. 
One people thing I drive say. down from New York to trick or treat. Oh yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They come there because they have people have family parties for Halloween around here, and there's a pretty good amount of cars you'll see from New York. Uh, there were none, hardly any at all. Um, there were some parties, but not a lot. Um, there was one or two I, I, I saw, but nothing, nothing big at all. Um, uh, a lot of people weren't around either. Um, they they weren't home, but uh, but even the the one thing that I did notice some of the observations, uh, my observations of people who hadn't decorated, uh, some of that when it was a little bit against that. Um, there were houses that weren't decorated that you know there was tables out or a sign that said go to side door and stuff like that. And they they had they had candy out. So I was a little surprised by that, which I was, I was happy with that. Um, that my observations from a couple of weeks ago that started the trek we ended up on the last two weeks kind of proved not to, uh, not to be the case. Uh, the case kind of proved to be uh, a lot more receptiveness to, uh, to Halloween than I thought there would be this year, which, which makes me happy. Um, however, I'm not a hundred percent sure that that is going to be, uh, the case as we move into the winter holidays coming up. Um, of course, you know, Thanksgiving, things like that. Uh, the, the Jewish holidays, uh, Christmas and, and all that new year's. I'm not a hundred percent sure it's going to be the case. I'd like to think differently. Um, yeah. I, I pretty much can tell you that we, what we usually do most likely isn't going to happen. Um, I tend to believe it's not because uh, we usually end up going to uh, my brother-in-law's uh, wife's family, but uh, we had a barbecue at my, at Elise's parents' And the one who holds the party sat, the sat there the entire time wearing a mask. So I'm going to say it's safe to assume they're probably not going to do it. Um, and I, I'm not sure my brother-in-law will either. I think we're going to end up being down here much smaller than, than expected. Than it would usually not be expected. Well, yeah, much uh, smaller than the expected norm. Um, and I believe that uh, for uh, for Christmas, I, I can what we usually do. Uh, that could end up being manipulated too, but uh, I mean, I'll discuss that in a few minutes. But yeah, I, I for sure, I think you're going to see major effects on what people do for Thanksgiving coming up next month. I, I or this month, perfect. sorry, this right, month, okay. this month, this month. Today's the I first. Say it is this month. I may be the wrong person on that one because uh, I know that my younger son uh, can't come home by Thanksgiving. Uh, there's a rotational system of dismissal from the dorms uh, over a series of days after the day before Thanksgiving so that they can limit the traffic in and out of the dorm. So he doesn't even know what day he'll be allowed to leave. It may be Thursday, the Thanksgiving day. It may be that Friday. It may be Saturday, Sunday. Um, we don't know. Uh, not, I'm, we're not overly concerned because we'll just spend time together when he gets home. It doesn't. I'm not. I'm not a guy who cooks a big tur turkey like you guys are. I'm so gonna, you know, just having having the kids home will be great. Justin's not coming home until the middle of December because he's not going to leave his apartment until after finals are over. Right. That wouldn't make it, that wouldn't make much sense. That would be a long trip. I mean, I know he's made it, but that's a long trip to, uh, especially no, during are, this time. Both of, them, uh, both of them, their classes end the day before Thanksgiving. Okay, that was that was what I was gonna. That was the question I was gonna ask: was how does it work that he comes home on Sunday? But that makes sense now. Uh, so they're done. So they're they're finals. Oh, they're, 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 finals will all be online. Uh, they may actually oh, okay. have a class or two. They may have actually a class or two online after Thanksgiving, but both schools have said nothing is allowed to be in person after the when the day before Thanksgiving because they don't want people leaving for 
to go family and then come bringing that shit back. Oh, that's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah. Right. So uh, Justin could technically come home for Thanksgiving, but he has chosen to stay on, uh, stay in his apartment, which is off campus, until everything is done, including his finals, because it really doesn't matter to him. And stuff. Hey Elvis, how are you? Uh, <laughs> um, he's chosen. You know, he wants to focus on everything. So it, it, it's a different, very different situation for me. I don't have the kids living here right now, and they won't physically be home for Thanksgiving. And of course, Christmas is not a thing for us. So. Um, uh, they'll be here for Hanukkah, I guess. Um, but we, we've already, uh, years have gone by. We don't do much in the way of Hanukkah, you know, a couple of things, but not a, like a present every night, like little kids get. So, um, it's a very different thing it's, it, for us. It's all about spending time together. So they'll be here for a number of weeks, probably at least four to six weeks. Uh, and, uh, in that time we'll eat a lot of food and sometimes we'll pretend it's Thanksgiving. <laughs> Now, unless I could hire one of you to come and cook the big feast, that'd be good. <laughs> well, that, that's an option. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, that, that's definitely some kind of option. Um, Doug, I mean, it, I'm sure you have thoughts on this and something to add. Yeah, well, uh, already my uh, cousin was signaling that, uh, you know, his family, he was here uh, yesterday. And uh, his family always is a uh, big, uh, they always come over for Thanksgiving. So it's like my uncle and my dad and all, and all them and all my brother and uh, his family all come up every year. And uh, my cousin was like, well, I don't know, Auntie Anne, you know, she's a little bit older. She might, she's still a little weary about the whole COVID thing after being in the hospital. And, uh, you know, they're a little bit older anyway. So uh, he's like, I don't know if they're going to make it up. And I was like, eh. That's interesting. And my other cousin, Zach, he uh, normally um, uh, comes every other year. So uh, this is not his year. So uh, Thanksgiving will be, I don't know. It's looking like it's curtailing to be smaller, but my mom at the other end is like, uh, you know, we're always a family that uh, anybody that doesn't have a place comes here. I mean, uh, the other year I was inviting the lady from the dollar store, <laughs> the front, ear, uh, front cashier. And she came, and that was very interesting. She was like a little bit of a different person, but she came and uh, had a great time. So uh, we're always at house, and everybody, you know, mm -hmm. just comes to enjoy themselves at all. And like I said, I'm picking up uh, this new thing where um, I'm going to be. Uh, I used to work in the Nork Soup Kitchens uh, for probably about five, six years. So I will be donating time and uh, trying to get my family also motivated to help out uh, over here in Allentown. So uh, yeah, I'll be doing uh, some soup kitchen stuff for the, at least the next 12, well, in November, like 12 weeks or so, you know, working in the soup kitchen there. So. Right. Yeah. You're a better man than I, my friend. I mean, I probably should be doing stuff like that, especially since I'm uh, uh, unburdened with children. Where are you, are you going to be doing it local to you? Yeah, Alan. Okay. Sit down. Local to Bath, to where you live. Yeah, Allentown. It's like like a couple of miles away, but uh, they have a lot of homeless over in Allentown, so uh, it's a great hub for that, and a lot of um like local places, like I was saying, is like doing all kinds of clothing drives and all right now. So that's another great way to help out. But, um, you know, I've all, one of my big things with the scouts and all was always uh, volunteering. And I'm a big volunteer. And that's one of the things that I hope to see my kids as we grow, as they grow up to be big volunteers as well. You know, like even working at the farm, uh, you know, the past couple of years, we work at that farm and like it's all volunteers and all the food goes to all the local like like food banks and all that we grow so um that's what i hope that one of the good things that my i hope my kids take away from me when, when i'm gone is that you know dad was a good volunteer and they will be too right that's that's um that's uh something that probably in the near future um 
maybe not this year. I mean, nine and six is a little young to do things like that. But uh, yeah, COVID year is a little tough too. Well, yeah, that too. Uh, nine and six, I think, is a little bit young. Ten and seven, maybe. If not this, that next year, maybe year after, uh, would be a, that'd be a good age to go do things like that. Um, as for like I said, as for us, I think it'll probably be um, will be small, um, and uh, I'm not sure um, if we do it at my in laws. I mean, there's always you know, it's always an option. I'm pretty sure. I yeah. wish we had the option of doing it here, but I don't think we really do. Don't, if you don't travel to these other relatives that you typically would travel to, would you have Thanksgiving dinner or Christmas dinner with a Zoom camera open to the other family, the other part of the family, while they're having dinner as well? Um, yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think it would, it's also going to depend on, uh, and I don't know what my brother-in-law and sister-in-law are going to do. Um, I don't know if they'll come to us. I really have no idea, but yeah, that, that's, that's something we would do. Um, I, do, I, it wouldn't be, probably wouldn't be our place to, well, actually probably the one to, to do that is most likely going to be my brother-in-law. Um, cause he's, he's done, we've done a few of them, uh, that he's, he's set up, uh, to see, um, a family. We have, I mean, we have, uh, my wife's family has, has family. My wife's, my wife has family in Japan in, uh, right now, um, her cousin married a, a military man and they're in, uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I know what, what the, the town, I just can't remember for the life of me what town he's in, what town they're in, but they're in Japan right now. They're overseas. He's, they've been all over the world. Um, so we've, we've, we've connected with them through that. Um, and then my grandfather-in-law who's in Florida, who is turning a hundred in January, uh, which really, that's one of the biggest things that sucks is we had planned on going down there for his birthday. Where is there? My, uh, Florida, uh, Coconut Creek. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. I mean, it <laughs> sucks. It sucks. It really sucks that it's, it's not going to happen. Uh, because if we were driving, it might be one thing, but it's only, uh, we only would have like two days, three days, maybe to do it. And it's just not, not going to happen because it's, you know, 24 hours down, 24 hours back, something like that. And it's not, not conducive because you're there for less than a day. And it's not something any of us really would want to do. Um, because honestly, I don't even know if with the two kids, us and my in-laws, we could make it 24 hours. Uh, I, I think it would be more than that. It would definitely be more than that, I think. You, you would need a lot of duct tape. I hear you. Yeah, we, 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 we did make it to... Oh, no. That took longer than that, too. Uh, with the stopover uh, in Georgia, it took us uh, a little over... I guess 29 hours, something like that, because we were there by about 10 o'clock in Orlando to get to, to Disney last year. Uh, two years. Oh, geez, two years ago. We were in, no, this week we were in on a cruise, uh, which actually was one of the last cruises that not long, you know, obviously everything happened. And that was the cruise that we were on actually was the ship that came back with all the COVID cases from the Caribbean when this all started. Like the first wave of it, like the, one of the first incidents was that cruise ship coming back from the Caribbean with cases of COVID. <laughs> so uh, that, that was interesting. That was an eye opener. Um, yeah, I'll bet it was. But now we, that, that's an interesting idea. Um, 
Uh, but like I said, I mean, that, that's, I'm sure we could try it. Why not? So I'm going to throw a hairball into the conversation. Um, but you knew we couldn't avoid the topic. We talk about Thanksgiving and whether or not COVID will inhibit our abilities to spend time with the family that we normally spend time with. Right. Do you think that the drastically predicted civil unrest will also have an impact on things like interstate travel at some point in over the next, let's say two to four weeks? And how will that affect your getting together with family? How, how do you even talk about that with uh, young girls that you have, Jason? I mean, I can have pretty mature conversations with Justin and Jeremy, but they're 18 and 21. Um, boy, how, how do you look at your, your young daughters and say, you know, we can't really go see uh, your aunt and uncle because there's too many people killing each other on the interstate highway? I mean, that's a really tough question, a really tough topic. Uh that really isn't a, um, wouldn't be a, a, uh, a factor um, because we don't, we largely are, um, fam, our, both our families largely are in tri-state area, first off. Second off, we don't, we didn't go <laughs> to Brooklyn or anything like that very often anyway to go visit family before this happened. So they usually came to us or came to my in-laws. That really wouldn't, isn't going to be a, wouldn't be a major issue uh, to me because we don't have, we don't have a lot of family outside, but outside of my grandfather, my wife's grandfather, nobody, they're all, within a centralized area here between uh, the furthest person away besides from him is my father's side of the family lived in Pennsylvania and Elise has only met a couple of them. And that was probably, the, and the last time we saw them, uh, Sadie wasn't even born yet. So, and in fact, my father doesn't even talk to most of them. What point. you're saying, Jason, is that the biggest reason you might not see family who might even be down the block or, you know, in, in the same state is more because of health reasons than the potential of uh, distance traveling being restricted because of other issues. Sure. Right. Okay. Sure. What about you, Doug? Yeah, I mean, um, like even uh, my son was like saying, and it, it's, it brought up a good point, and uh a little bit of uh, like how to discuss it um, is just the fact that two people that nobody really cares for either one, how much like discourse is like created over these two men, regardless of what side you're on, you know, it's just like the, how vehement people are on either side. It, like he couldn't understand. And I said, well, it's not even necessarily the men that we're talking about. It's the issues that will shape our, you know, tomorrow that really is more of a factor than it than these men that neither like side really is confident or or is in love with i mean you might say people are in love with trump but are they really in love with trump i don't know you know so um you know it is interesting that there's like we've come to like such hatred of each other just over these two men it's true but you know as adults and what we're trying to explain to him is you know the bigger issue is the issues that will be facing us in the next four years, you know? And um, do I think civil unrest? I don't, I mean, I, I think it's a little bit overblown. I think the more that the media continues this narrative, the more potential it has for exploding. But I, I, I rather like, like uh, duck my head and pretend like it's not happening outside of like, uh, major cities and um you know <laughs> almost like a sporting team like winning a, a trophy or something i i hope it if anything happens it's like that but at the same time it was just interesting that uh i didn't really think about it uh like walmart like uh 
taking guns off the shelves that they're no no longer selling guns in like different specific that. areas or you know just you know not even maybe not selling them but at least taking them out of the store so even if there is a riot they're not on the shelves for people to steal you know so uh you know it's a real potential and it's you know it, it could be explosive but i i i want to believe that it's more hype it's more of a story it's a byline than what will actually happen but uh you know uh i maybe that's just uh, my own uh opinion of uh like i said keeping my head in the sand and not realizing you know maybe how the rest of the world like sees this compared to myself I'm but uh, thinking perhaps but yes i agree uh, yeah. no i do, i do want to correct one thing though keith um that you mentioned about going to see family in other places um that that what i what i mentioned about uh them coming to us in most cases, nothing to do with um, with health. Um, it's they would, you know, my my mother in law was is. Uh, it's just that um, would you, she would usually and probably I I don't know what she's going to do about uh, inviting people or anything like that, but uh, I don't. I don't see it travel being an issue for us with because of COVID right now. Um, I just I, I don't see it being a big deal because we've had we've had family come for for barbecues at my in laws house like I said earlier uh, already. So I don't know. I I don't know. Um, there may be less people invited, but I have a feeling that that it's going to be there could be something for sure. Uh, now getting into which I really didn't want to uh, get into, but uh, there is going to be civil unrest no matter who's elected president, any way you look at it, um, because <clears throat> the thing is. You can't have someone who is supposed to be the leader of the free world turn around and say things like he has said and not think that it is going to motivate certain groups of people to act violently. Um, and I'm not just talking about one side. Because his words, and I've said it before, some of the things that he has said are essentially like pouring napalm on a raging inferno. Uh, because you had that the adage of uh, of the burning house. Uh, this country is more than a burning house right now. Uh, it's not a burning house. It's uh, it's the magnitude of the fires in California blowing way out of control. It's not a burning house anymore. You are way past that. And it is to an extent fueled by comments of a man who's supposed to lead us. That's all well and good. He's entitled to his opinion. He is the leader of the free world. He absolutely is entitled to say things that he might want to say. However, as that leader, he cannot say these things and expect this country, everyone in this country, to stand behind what he says and to follow what he wants. It's not going to happen. You can't say things like when the looting starts, the shooting starts. And when COVID happens, you can't turn around and say it is what it is as nearly a quarter of a million people are dead because of his, yes, all of theirs, but partially his actions or inactions. 
during this. Question for you, not to go down the political rabbit hole. I'm the last person in the world who's going to speak on behalf or defend the actions of the current president of the United States. But with that said, who's making this worse? The leader of the free world or the media? And I'm not necessarily saying social media because I think that social media is somewhat inspired by the reporting media as well. And I'm not, again, I'm not making a statement that says the media is more responsible than the president. But I think it goes without saying that the media itself in the true wag the dog tradition is going out of its way to create a scenario that most lemmings, I'm sorry, I mean US citizens will follow. Uh, and, and a lot of the civil unrest that may be coming in the next few weeks may be because the media and the president have set the stage for almost an expectation that that is what should happen or that is what will happen. And I, I think that the media, both left side and right side, has gone out of its way to create a scenario where lots of people may die violently so they can cover the news and, and that's what pe people want to see is violence in, in in the streets i think we may be are entering a phase of the biggest wag the dog we've ever had in our country's history the thing is you're using uh, you're talking about somebody now essentially what the president has attempted to do with his twitter account is he has essentially tried to use that use Twitter the way FDR used the fireside chats. He's tried to use it in that manner of a tool to get his message out. The problem is the message <laughs> that is the exact problem the problem is the message when you have somebody like i said and i'm using this as an example because this is the biggest example of it right now of an aptitude um you're talking about someone who as i said we are fast approaching a quarter of a million people dead because of the COVID pandemic. We are somewhere around 230,000. And despite claims, even today by the White House, uh, that Mr. Fauci was using, um, was playing politics with his comments, um, we had 90,000 new cases last week. In one day, there was 90,000 new cases. Numbers were going down. I will not deny the numbers were going down. In June. But here we are in month, what, eight, six, eight, something like that. And on pretty much November 1st, eight months in nearly, you're back about, back at levels where of numbers of cases that you haven't hit before. You're above those numbers. Highest we had seen was about 80, 85,000. And we actually pretty much broke that. Uh, earlier this week. So you got to sit here and wonder. Now, I, I'll, I'll say that I'll, I will make one comparison between current and former sitting, pre former president. Okay. On one hand, in the middle, right before the second debate in 2000. 
eight. So sorry, not eight. 2012. Um, you had the attack on Benghazi, and the president at the time, President Obama, turned around and said, "The buck stops here." When it was brought up in debate by uh, the moderator, and at that point, his approval ratings were low, lower, were on the lower end for a sitting president. But after that debate, his numbers quickly started to rise because he said, the buck stops here. The common phrase that's used often, but when he said it, people went, all right. He took response, he, he, he kind of grabbed the bull by the horns there. Okay, good. Now you look at where we are now with COVID-19. And like I said, I'm going to use specifically COVID-19 because I feel it's the bigger issue. Where we are with COVID-19, you have him yelling at Fauci. He has uh, raged and said that Joe Biden is going to listen to scientists if he wins. He has said it is what it is. He has downplayed the pandemic after getting COVID-19, saying basically, well, I beat it as 235,000 people have died. Um, meanwhile, they gave him drugs reserved for severe patients. Okay. When in the previous election, he said certain things and she said certain things, uh, Clinton said certain things and it just was always kind of okay. But this is a pandemic on a scale like we've never seen. We've never seen anything like this. We've never faced anything like this. You can talk about the flu in the 1900s, but this is pretty much, it's on that level. The problem is he has tried to use Twitter to his advantage and he continuously rails on the experts who are trying to give their best opinion and help us out the best we can as this thing continues to fail and blow up in his face more and more every day. So I can't, you can rage on the media all you want, <laughs> but he is fueling the fire with Twitter. He is fueling the fire with social media. You can't deny that fact. Yeah, I mean, uh, they, they should. Go ahead, Doug. Oh, no, I was going to say that. Yeah, a president, anybody should use every tool that they have in their arsenal. And I, I don't disagree that, you know, he's maybe fueling the fire, like you said. But also, at the same time, we as Americans, we, we, we don't need to necessarily rely on what the president said. Like you said, we're in six or eight months of this. We know what we need to be doing or not doing. And, um, you know, <laughs> to, to like, like blame this, well, you can blame it on, I don't really care, you know, and like you said, uh, yes, the buck stops here and always should stop at the, at, at the top. But, um, I'm just saying that, you know, we all need to, we all know what we need to be doing or not doing. I don't think at this point. Well, we makes do? Sense. Sure. We do, but it doesn't seem like. Um, certain people, especially his followers, want to or are, and those are where the largest hotspots are right now. You can't deny that. But I mean, it's like all of Europe. Like we're not like other countries, obviously, because like we, we uh, Wales went under lockdown. What last Friday? The rest of Europe has gone under lockdown. What this week? So I mean, you know, but but going back to that. They were in lockdown, uh, in lockdown to begin with. We never went into full lockdown, and they had significantly less cases in every country in the world besides from here, except for what? But now they're, where are they now? They're back in lockdown. If you, but if you compare the numbers, 
They had theirs were on the rise. They were going up, and their numbers have dropped. But there's no like actual standard on comparing these numbers. I see, you know. Uh, I can see my eyes. There's a big difference between four figures and high five figures. There's a big difference. Tell me I'm wrong. Well, regardless, back to the the media thing. yeah, I, I think that it's definitely part and parcel that the media is definitely driving a lot of this, as well as, you know, the president using different types of media. But you, you can't say, like, say that the media isn't inciting a lot, almost <laughs> the majority of this. I mean, you know, and people are going to go ahead, like you said, different groups are going to go ahead and do what they want to because there's so much bad information and people are angry and they're going to do anything like uh, the right we saw in D.C. like uh, this week. Well, I guess it's last week now, you know, where any minor infraction is going to cause people to go right in the streets. And what I was going to say earlier about um, Keith's like point about uh, just uh, is there any place that we're like staying away from? I wanted to go to Philly and because of silver and press, I'm staying away from Philly, it, you know, but um, just to recap, like a bunch of comments I wanted to jump in on, but I didn't, <laughs> so. I mean, if we really wanted to go down this, this road, and this has nothing to do with our podcast necessarily, but what is the uh, business and economic impact of what the president's comments and the media's actions, what will the impact be in the coming weeks? Because I guarantee you there will be a lot of urban-based companies that even if they've started bringing their employees back to the office previously, will probably tell them to stay home right now because in the urban areas, we're gonna have more of this unrest than in the rural areas, um, comparatively speaking at least. So. The mere fact that a lot of companies will temper some of their business to protect their employees, uh, boarding up their their shops and and you know those are the small business owners and such, but there could be a severe economic impact just from the fear that's been incited by all the, the comments in media and from the president and all that. I, I don't know whether the president's more responsible than the media or the media is more responsible than the president. It depends on what side of the media you're talking about. Right. I mean, it, it depends on a lot of things. Uh, they're all they're all guilty of it. In a, in, but you know, the the president uh, should have the ability. The president isn't shouldn't be doing it because of financial gain. You know, the media is doing it because they're trying to sell more advertising and yeah. get more viewers. That shouldn't be the president's motivation. So if you want to hang him out to dry on that, that's fine. I would I would certainly agree with that. Um, well, you have the you have the media that, um, and it's both sides of the media that, um, especially recently, that have um, been inciting action uh, from the public. Um, there was a um, some media outlets that um, the thing is. You have both sides of the media and the president uh, making false claims, which is another fact that isn't taken into account very often. Um, the f- the f- sheer uh, muckraking is back in a big way in this country, and it's a very scary thought of um, of that rearing its head again um it's it's in fact very scary that uh, that muckrake has seemingly come to the forefront in this election more than any in a very long time um and you're going to you're going to see the impact of that kind of journalism very quickly here huh. and <laughs> results may vary 
but uh, <laughs> I never thought I'd actually have to say this, but um, the media and the politicians are going to lead this country into a second civil war. You speak of it in the future tense. I'm not so sure we're not already there. We're not there yet. It's coming, but we're not there yet. And it definitely is not just the media. It's, uh, it's both sides of the aisle. And uh, the... Um, who's going to suffer worse than all this is the public, the American public and the children. Children are really going to be the ones who suffer the worst because this is something they should never have been subjected to seeing. Fortunately, you have um, beliefs and things that it's just Put it this way, Martin Luther King is spinning in his grave. Oh As every good political leader that is not, uh, that has uh, come along in our lifetimes, previous lifetimes, they're all up in arms, right? About, uh, about the state that, not just America, that this world is in. Do you think it's, I mean, we, we are, we are subject to American media. Um, do you think it is or is not worse here than it is in many other countries? I would say that no, it's worse. It's Go ahead, Doug. Oh, no, I was going to, I think I'm going to agree with you, but yeah, I was going to say it's worse here. And, uh, it's just interesting because, uh, uh, well, a lot of my wife's family, like, uh, you know, live abroad, as well as a lot of the advertisers I work with uh, live abroad. And uh, they were just say, commenting about uh, where is America's like, like actual fact, like uh, news organization, because they they find it interesting that uh, if they were to rely, rely on, Fo well, on CNN, they can't and they have to switch over to Fox and see both sides and then disseminate for themselves. They said, we're the BBC. They just know it's left leaning and uh, it always has been. And it's uh, very interesting over, over there with, but they think that their um, news process is a lot more their way where my friend Aaron in Australia will tell you that Australian news is, but he says that he thinks that they're, also leaning either to the left but um you know and i don't mean like necessarily like fractions but actually what you see on the television the news that you see on the television that everybody is seeing is mostly you know leaning somewhat towards the left but um you know if you know that then great but I think that the American journalism is, you know, they, they try to say that they're clear and concisive and that they're, I you know, disagree. telling you the truth. But what? I disagree with Go you. Ahead. I very highly disagree with you. Um, you I, considering the most watched News networks are Republican. I gotta disagree with you. I think that that the media has a right slant in a lot in some of it. Um, in mainstream media, the slant has been slightly right for the last few years, uh, it, but it swings. It always swings. Uh, right now, I mean, you're you're. You, but I was like considering that you have to take an action to actually watch Fox News, where like ABC, NBC, CBS are stuff that you get on your like on your television every day. It's what you turn on your computer. 
hey, my ter- my computer turns on to MSNBC. Like, you know, well, that's all your, your Google searches. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> all right. But my, it came factory built, let's say. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, really kidding. <laughs> I can now go retrieve my eyeballs because that sort of came as a surprise. <laughs> Uh, no, <laughs> uh, um, no, Keith. Uh, I, I think you've missed something along the way that Doug isn't. Uh, t- Doug kind of uh, politically probably leans a little closer to libertarian than he does to Republican. Um, I know when it comes to All right. yeah, his yeah. religious background, I agree with that. Has its sway, but he definitely leans more libertarian politically than he does Republican. I, I, I guess you missed something somewhere along the way. I've kind of seen that all along, that it's more libertarian for sure. Doug? What I'm not going to argue with you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh. <laughs> I will tell you that, honestly, um, my first two presidential elections, um, I voted for uh, somebody I probably shouldn't have, but um, <laughs> in hindsight, he wasn't the best president. Actually, so, sorry, no, I, I voted from the first time, not the second. Um, the second I did vote uh, for the other guy, even though I really didn't like him very much. Um, my third election, I did, uh, I voted clearly, obviously, for, you can know, know who I voted for. Uh, but the one before this one, uh, Romney and Obama, um, I had my conflicts. I had my doubts. Um, and up and even after, you know, the second debate, actually after all the debates, uh, the one thing that finally fully turned me off was Mitt Romney. As I'm sitting there watching the rain start to come out my wind, come down out my window, and then we go into a um, about f- a week's worth of <laughs> disaster uh, in this con- in this area from Sandy. Uh, the ultimate moment where I turned off to Mitt Romney was him standing in Ohio and turning around and going, "Well, hurricane never hit Ohio, as we're about to get destroyed." Meanwhile, our governor left his campaign to come back to his state to take care of it and the RNC basically wrote him off for a while. So um, I actually am a a pragmatist in some cases and I had my issues with with my I have my issues with both candidates but um, like I said I mean the the handling of, of COVID and it's everybody from the top down, everybody takes blame in that. Um, but here we are. Um, you could rattle off one thing about something about one candidate, and then you can counter it with something about the other. Because neither candidate is a model person, a model citizen, a model anything. Uh, anybody who would look up to either one of these two guys, there's got to be, a, there's a screw loose somewhere. Um, fortunately, to an extent, at least, this will be over coming this week. Um, I wish I had downloaded it. Uh, I will actually post it. Uh, there's uh, something that I saw earlier this week, um, and that is the fact that um, after this election, you're still your neighbor is still your neighbor. Um, hopefully, uh, we can remember that. I'll post the the whole quote later on, uh, but it goes into uh, saying that. Uh, Trump won't be there to bring in your, your groceries and Biden won't be there to fix your car. Your neighbor will. 
<laughs> I like that sentiment and all. And uh, but a lot of my uh, hardcore left fans would say that uh, that's something that a Republican or uh, and I I thought it was like just like an obvious human thing, but they're saying that that's only something that you know people from the right would say that they're trying to divert their own feeling. And it's uh, really annoying that you can't even say like human things anymore uh, without somebody like being in opposition to you. <laughs> Meanwhile, it was my brother-in-law who's a, uh, who's a liberal who said it, uh, who posted it. Actually, I can read it to you now. Uh, oh no, I don't disagree. I'm just oh, saying okay. that uh, a lot. But, here, here you go. Yeah. I'm just saying that, uh, yeah, it does Sorry. sound. You're right. Um, after the election, after the elections are over, your neighbor will still be your neighbor. Trump will not be there to ring up your groceries. Your neighbor will. Biden will not be there to fix your car or help you without help you out with yard work. Your neighbor will. Both Trump and Biden will still be in their wealthy political world and will be in ours. They'll both be doing their thing while you and I live together, work together, learn together, shop together, eat together, worship together, and pump our own pump our guests next to one another. Well, we don't, but our, our neighbors, I guess, will. Uh, we are what we are what makes America great. We are the ones who choose to be decent, loving, caring, and compassionate human beings. Vote for whomever you choose to vote for in November. But remember, we, the people, choose to shape our communities, not them. Jason, we lost your picture. Yeah, I know. I had to shut it off to read it. Details yeah. <laughs> like that. Come on. Well, you did look better when the picture was off, so it's okay. <laughs> So I, th I think that pretty much brings us to a pretty decent endpoint. I was glad I was able to finally, you know, figure out a way to get that read. And I will post it uh, once Keith posts the show. I will post the excellent in the Dads on Life page. But uh, but that was pretty poignant to uh, to the truth, and it's a truth that hopefully we haven't completely lost sight of, and maybe we can gain a grasp of in the coming. Anybody else got anything to add? No, I'm getting soaked here in the rain. What can I say? It's pouring yeah. like some bitch here. You are. <laughs> Except for Chad, who probably, you got any secret? who's probably about to be in a hotel in Miami somewhere in the warm, well, probably not sunshine, but it'll be warm there, I'm sure. <laughs> you got any secret tips to chicken pot pie? What's that? You got any secret tips to chicken pot pie? That's what I'm going inside to finish. <laughs> uh, just make sure that you're you're. Oh, you're already you're finishing it. As long as you egg washed, well, I have to. I, no, I didn't get that far. No, <laughs> but you that's why I'm making three probably, chicken pot pie. Just pull it out and finish it with the egg wash. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a pretty good end point for us this week. Um, and hope we will have more next week. Probably, maybe we'll have results for what's going to come and be able to do a little more on what the shape of the future is. Boy, is uh, let me tell you. What'd you say? I said, boy, are you optimistic? Uh, well, <laughs> we'd take an unbelievable, unprecedented landslide for us to actually have the results in, in less than a week. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. But you never know. Um, from all of us here at Dads on Life, take care, everybody. Be good.